of the U.S. and good afternoon to others in the U.S. and to our speaker, John Day. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Speaking to us from tomorrow, so you should have a good perspective on what the future brings. <laughs> Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce John, who's going to be speaking about uh, two perspectives on evaluating MPA management and effect management effectiveness, lessons learned from Australia's Great Barrier Reef and Indian MPAs. Uh, and I will introduce John in just a moment here, but I want to encourage and invite all of our uh, participants and listeners to send in your comments and questions in the question box, and that we're going to be certain to have plenty of time for discussion at the end. So as you hear things that John discusses that you want to hear a little bit more about or you have questions or comments about, please feel free to go ahead and type those in. Uh, so John is a protected area planner and manager. He was uh, worked in Australia for 39 years, including 28 years in the Great Barrier Reef. He was one of the directors at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and was variously responsible for the conservation planning and heritage, especially world heritage. Indigenous Partnerships and beginning the first Great Barrier Reef Outlook Report. And for his leadership role within the Representative Areas Program, the Barrier Reef Wide Rezoning uh, that took place from 1999 to 2003, he was awarded an Australian Public Service Medal and a Smithsonian Queensland Fellowship. And he retired from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority in 2014 to undertake a post-career PhD at James Cook University, documenting the lessons learned in planning and managing the Great Barrier Reef. And today's webinar is part of that. So John, I will turn it over to you and thanks for being with us. Thanks very much, Lauren. And hopefully people can A, hear me and B, understand the Australian accent. So as uh, Lauren indicated, I wanna give a quick perspective on uh, what I'm calling MPA management effectiveness. And I'm doing this from the two perspectives of both the Great Barrier Reef and India. So I'll start off giving a, an overview of what I'm calling MEE, a quick overview of the marine park, but most of the talk will be about the assessment within the Great Barrier Reef and also a proposed assessment uh, for Indian MPAs. And we'll finish off with some lessons learned and hopefully some questions. So sort of what is MEE? Um, the people who are experts in this are people like Mark Hawkins, who have been doing it for a while. So here's a, a definition from Hawkins and his colleagues, assessment of how well uh, an MPA in our case or a protected area is being managed, primarily the extent to which it is protecting values and achieving its goals and objectives. And as I said, the work done by uh, Hawkins and co is really the stuff that I've been using, but there are many management approaches being developed around the world. So the Hawkins work is, is uh, being published by IUCN and the World Commission on Protected Areas. Effectively, what they have is a, uh, an outline or a process which is now globally endorsed and, and sort of best practice with six key elements shown in green here. And effectively, what Mark and co say is that if you look at this approach, starting with context at the top, and understanding planning and inputs, processes, outputs and outcomes, it looks at all elements of management. Uh, for example, you can get an outcome through either good luck or good management. And you really want to know whether that outcome was achieved because of you had the right planning inputs or the right the planning and the right inputs, whether you used the right process or whether, as I said, it was just good luck and, and uh, couldn't be repeated. So this approach of assessing management effectiveness is repeatable over time could really focus where your efforts go. So that's important. Today, all of us have got uh, constrained resources and the threats are changing. So this is an important approach. And I think it's also readily understood by decision makers and stakeholders. If we do it effectively, it can have many benefits. And I won't read every one of them, but you can see there on the screen, things like improving decision making, providing feedback on the management to the decision makers. And the last, last one I have is that you can use this to justify the need for additional resources. So what is it? I mean, just in, in simple terms, we've got the six elements. So context and planning, really, where are we now and where do we want to be? Where do we need to go and how do we go about it? And what were the results and what did we achieve? So that's a sort of simple way of looking at the six elements. In terms of outputs and outcomes, there's sometimes confusion. You know, outputs are really the goods and services that produce during the management cycle as a result of your actions. 
whereas outcomes are the effects of management. And these may take uh, years, and, and they're a mixture of a whole lot of process, products, and change in behavior. The way that Mark and co have looked at it is by asking a simple, or a series of relatively simple questions around each of these six elements. And so the sort of questions under context, what is the significance, what are the values, what are the key uses, what are the threats, who are the stakeholders, and perhaps how does it fit into a national context? So those are the sorts of questions that Mark has been asking. And I'll quickly just scan through it and you can read it. So things like planning, objectives and targets, under inputs, things like personnel and the finance going in, under processes, who helps to manage, uh, training, cumulative impacts, and outputs and outcomes. Again, a series of key questions that help us look at these six elements. When we started doing management effectiveness in the Great Barrier Reef, nothing had ever been done at the scale and the complexity of a protected area like the Great Barrier Reef. And the Great Barrier Reef Act has now been amended, which actually requires formally an assessment of uh, how we're going with management effectiveness. So the wording in the Act now says an assessment of the existing measures to protect and manage the ecosystem within the Great Barrier Reef region. And the requirement is to do this every five years, which leads to a thing called the Outlook Report. And this legislation came in in 2007, and since that we've had two five-yearly reports, 2009 and 2014. And just as an aside, it's something I think is, is quite a useful approach to looking at not just management effectiveness, but a whole way of looking at the information about a protected area. But let me quickly digress and talk about the reef for those who aren't aware of it, or perhaps the size and complexity. We're talking about an area of 344,000 square kilometers, over 2,300 kilometers in length. And it, at its widest, it's uh, 250 kilometers off the, off the coast. Equally important as the actual reef is the area that impacts it. And so we've got a catchment adjacent to the Great Barrier Reef that is over 1.2 times the size of the marine park. And so this has a huge impact downstream on the marine park. In terms of area, just to put it into a context for those people coming in around the world, we're talking about an area of the Great Barrier Reef, similar to many countries. The other important thing is it covers 14 degrees of latitude. There are many other large MPAs around the world, but many of them are in similar latitudes, whereas this really stretches over 14 degrees. And the point, the bottom map, I like to point out to my American and US colleagues, if you put it on the Great Barrier Reef on the west coast, it would stretch from the Canadian border down to the Mexican border. So what we've got is not really a typical MPA in terms of its size or its complexity. But what we have is an MPA which is similar in many of the issues to other coastal and marine areas around the world. And I've just listed there some of the key issues facing the Great Barrier Reef. And again, I would say these are the same sorts of issues that are facing many, many others around the world. But the other important issue, which many of us are facing, we're not knowing how to ad address, is the one of cumulative impacts. And again, I think this is a, an area of a, uh, a lot of work is still needed. Just to finish off the overview of the reef, many people are aware of our zoning, which came to effect in 2004, so it's in effect today. People are aware that about one third of the total area shown by those green zones is no take. But many people aren't aware that it's equally important for conservation is the fact that about two thirds of the area fully protects the, the bottom of the benthams. But I also want to stress that zoning is only one of our management tools. We've got many other uh, statutory tools in our toolbox that we use. So zoning is an important layer. It's a cornerstone of our management, but it's only one of many, many tools. I think it's an important point. So let's get back to management effectiveness. Oh, sorry, before we do, let's quickly look. Uh, it's definitely a, a multiple use park. It always has been. And the legislation in 1975 made it very clear that all reasonable activities were allowed, but under very strict controls. And one of the uh, controls we use is the zoning. So people are amazed to find out in the Great Barrier Reef, we have things like bottom trawling in some areas. We have things like defense training using high explosives. And we also allow works, including dredging in some areas. But I want to stress those are only in certain zones and under very strict conditions. But it's definitely a multiple use area.
Okay, so back to management effectiveness. With a complex area like the Great Barrier Reef of size, we decided to look at not everything, but to choose a number of uh, elements to assess for management effectiveness. So we chose four values, you can see them there, eight direct uses at the bottom, and what we called some external impact on the values. So these 15 management ele elements were the things we decided to try and assess against the IUCN framework. And the way we went about it in the Great Barrier Reef is initially we brought in some independent assessors, but the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority officers collated the information against these 15 elements, and we provided that in a um, large uh, set of folders and, and uh, websites and, and links to the assessors, which they went away and then did their independent assessment. They came up with a preliminary rating, and then they came back and discussed those with staff, and there were some things where we recognised we hadn't provided perhaps all the information we knew, so there was an iterative approach to it. And then they had a final workshop with the chairs of the, what we call our reef advisory committees as a sort of an independent and, and uh, external assessment against their final ratings. So I want to stress it was done externally by independent assessors, but with a large amount of input from the different officers. When we assessed it, or when the management uh, experts assessed it, we decided on choosing a four-point scale. Uh, you can see it here, from A, effective, through to D, ineffective. And we deliberately chose the four-point because we think if, it's, uh, if you have five or three, often people will just sit in the middle. This really forces people to, to go one side on the effective side or the, or the ineffective or partially effective side. So we believe the four-point scale is appropriate. But it's also important when you're looking at this, just because you get a ranking of A, effective, doesn't mean you can't approve. So it's really important to, to uh, point out to staff and all those involved and, and the stakeholders, just because you get a certain ranking doesn't mean you can't change. And even a, a D effective is, um, you know, there are elements of some more ineffective than others. This is a quick summation. So looking across the top at the six elements, You'll notice that the outcomes were split, split into sort of an overall outcome and a biodiversity outcome against the 15 elements down the uh, left-hand side. And just to point you to a couple of them, uh, well, sorry, before we do, that's back to remind us, the, the green is effective, a bit like a traffic-like approach. If we look at down the bottom, defence was ranked as being effective across all elements of management effectiveness. Research didn't do too badly. And if you move, look halfway up the, the list, tourism was equally, um, you know, we didn't do too badly. But this was a bit of an eye opener. If we look at, say, coastal development, people were amazed to see that the independent assessors gave us mostly effective for context, but partially effective for everything else. And people said, well, hang on, how did that happen? We've got a huge number of plans. How do we only get partially effective for plans? We've got a huge effort going into coastal development. But the rationale of the independent assessors was you do have a huge number of plans, but they don't talk. So the planning is not integrated. And it was actually a bit of an eye opener to have this independent assessment approach, then coming and telling us where we needed to improve. Today, in the, or recently in the 2014 report, we did an assessment against how we were with the 2009. So you can see the little arrows here, whether they're going down, in other words, we, we're, uh, downward trend, whether we're improving or whether it's stable. So the arrows were useful. Um, and again, the color coding really just brings it home against the 15 elements that we chose. It also allowed us, as I said, to give some pretty strong uh, comments. So if you haven't seen the Outlook report, I'd really recommend you look at it. It's online and I'll give the reference at the end of the talk. Um, in the executive summary, it was very strong. It comes out clearly and says, those four elements at the top, climate change, water quality, impacts from coastal development, and some remaining impacts of fishing are the major threats to the future vitality of the reef. Then it went on to say, even with the recent management initiatives to reduce the threats and improve the resilience, the overall outlook for the Great Barrier Reef is poor, has worsened since 2009, and expected to further deteriorate in the future. That's pretty strong wording coming from a government report talking about an iconic area. But the reality is the assessment in the outlook report, not just the management effectiveness chapter, which again, as I said, was independent and very 
conclusive, but also the other assessments didn't give us any room to say anything but this sort of outcome or this sort of um, final summary. So I do stress that the Outlook report, I think, is a good example of looking at, uh, in an independent and uh, effective way, at a, a uh, marine protected area. What are some of the lessons we learned? Well, we learned that we needed to, when we were providing the data, both qualitative and quantitative data. Um, in our case, there was a more of an emphasis on the qualitative, and if possible, I think you need to move towards the quantitative, but I want to stress this assessment can look at both. You also need some clear flexibility and this idea of an iterative approach coming back to the provider's information and then cross-checking against further information, I think was useful. Some of the criteria questions were perhaps a bit loose. So something like reducing impacts is very broad. Um, you can reduce an impact in a, in a minor way or it can be a huge reduction. Both are reducing impacts and you know, mo both may end up being rated equally, but the reality is you know, perhaps some of the language we had was something we could improve. We also found that some of the criteria we'd set were a bit difficult to assess but the reality is the complexities were equal across all the management elements that we assessed. So we didn't see this as a major concern and didn't alter the final result. So effectively, let's jump now to India. Um, I was approached by a group called GIZ India to ask them to, or to help them assess management effectiveness in their marine and coastal areas. They were aware of the IUCN framework. In fact, they had been using it for many years for some of their terrestrial areas, their tiger reserves. But basically they said, look, we want something that is relatively simple and easy to understand. We're keen to look at something that can be done as a self-assessment approach. So we talked about a checklist and they also recognize that uh, there were very different MPAs across India. So they didn't want sort of one size fits all. I have worked with the people, we've come up with a framework which has been finalized but I'll talk more again at the end about some of the supporting documentation, which is still under review. So effectively, one of the things the Indians did was take me over there and, and show me. So the first place we went was on the West Coast, this place called Gujarat, which is certainly one extreme in terms of their marine protected areas. I then went over to the East Coast, and the Sundarbans, I'd say, is the other extreme. That's a very well-managed area with lots of resources. I was also lucky enough to go to the place called the Andaman Islands. If you ever get an opportunity, I'd really encourage you. It's a fantastic place. So we had three very diverse areas that we looked at using our assessment approach. I stress these aren't all their MPAs. These, when I've got the figure of 31, that's their coastal MPAs, including their islands. There are many others, um, tiny things around the coast. So again, we used the same overall context in India, the same IUCN framework. And we tried to come up with a simple set of questions for each of the six elements. And we also moved to this idea of using checklists and a scoring system, which again, allowed the managers to prioritize and, and help them understand where they need to put their management efforts. Same type of process, the same sort of uh, questions, but again, a much simpler approach. So if we look at context, looking at values and threats and stakeholders, we came up, oh, sorry, before I do that, I just want to stress, I, I kept saying to the Indians, unless they do this effectively, unless they under, have a good understanding of context and planning, they can be spending a lot of effort, wasted effort, in trying to produce, um, you know, determine their outcomes and things. So I really stress that this context and planning were absolutely fundamental foundations. So the self-assessment checklist we developed had a series of question, questions, and you can see here, the top two are the values of the MPA identified, documented and prioritized. And secondly, similar are the threats. So how did we do it? Well, we, we gave them a checklist, as I said, with a, um, a number of options and a rating score. So you can see if we work through this one, this is about values for a poor score. And I stress, I wanted to give it a score of zero. The Indians said, no, no, we want to give encourage. So let's give it a score of 2.5. But for poor, the definition was only a few values had been identified and documented. At the other end, in the very good end of the scale, all the values have been systematically identified, documented, assessed, and prioritized. 
You'll see that in the green, we actually gave an excellent score um, because you know, in some cases we recognized we could move towards that. But I have to be honest, very few of the MPAs I looked at, I think would get that score. But again, it gave people an idea of where they should be aiming. This is sort of the best practice. They might, if they assess it effectively or honestly, give themselves a poor or fair score. But the reality, they could see where they needed to move. So in the checklist, there's this type of approach for every one of the questions against the six elements. If we go to the second one, same thing about threats. A spectrum of questions or, or assessments that they could see, and if they look at it uh, effectively and honestly, they can see where they are now and where they need to be. But to help them, we move towards a series of what we call supporting documentation. So this was like a checklist. Here are some of the attributes that they might want to consider they have in their MPA. And again, not rocket science, pretty basic, but if we're using, everyone's using a consistent checklist, you can see what are your marine habitats, your coastal habitats, what are some of your key species, or perhaps your cultural values. So this was part of the supporting documentation to help them fill in this checklist or, or answer the checklist. But as well as just giving them the, the, uh, the, the uh, tables here, we also gave them form uh, or sort of forms, uh, pro formers to help understand it. So down the, the left hand side, you can see some of the values they might consider are in their MPA. But we also gave them the idea of how they might want to uh, assess it and using or building on the, the same approach in the Great Barrier Reef, you could end up with a pro forma looking something like that with again, a series of arrows showing where what the condition was, what the trend is by the arrow, and what's the significance and the importance of those values. Now again, this is a pro forma, not everyone did it exactly the way it should be, but they could see the sort of things that we needed to assess and then come back to that question, the very first question, how are the values, are they being well documented and identified? If we move to the, the question about threats, we talked here about assessing a series of factors. And I'll just take you through one example. If we look at transport infrastructure, again, we have give them in the supporting documentation a whole series of sort of checklists and things. So here's down the left-hand side some different types of infrastructure. We ask them to assess it looking at things like, is it having a positive or a negative impact on the values? Is it a current uh, impact or a potential impact? And is it actually happening inside or outside their property? And again, just this very simple approach got a lot of managers thinking way outside the box. They weren't even thinking about things that weren't in their MPA because it wasn't their responsibility. But when we talked about it, they realized, yes, it was having an impact. And so by providing, again, this simple pro forma, they can work through it. And just by simply acknowledging that, yes, it, uh, a road, one road might be a positive impact accessing the MPA or the area next to the MPA, but many roads could be having a negative impact. Um, some roads are current, many are being proposed. And in this case, the uh, roads might be inside the uh, MPA, but there might be other uh, uh, wharves and things. So this approach was again, just helping them understand a series of threats affecting their protected area. But as well as that, then we asked them to consider the negative ones and look again to try and prioritize which are the most important against these key elements again. What's the spatial scale? the temporal scale, the impact, your ability as a manager to respond, and what's the trend? And again, we gave them a simple uh, approach, and it's not perfect, but just allowed them to score themselves against the negative impacts uh, across their, their MPA. If we just finish off context, again, you can see there are a whole series of questions about ecosystem services, about stakeholders, and about governance. And again, wherever possible, we gave them checklists and pro formas to help them understand. And then they came back and applied it against those um, different criteria. So here's one <coughs> against the stakeholders. Um, poor, some of your stakeholders are known, but no mapping exists, nor do the stakeholders assist in management. Right through to excellent, all the stakeholders have been systematically mapped and prioritized, routinely and systematically updated, and regularly engaged. So you can see it's a pretty basic checklist. Um, as a self-assessment checklist, we'll talk about some of these issues in the end, but there are people who choose to 
perhaps fudge the results and try and say they're doing better than they, they are. That's why we need sort of independent auditing. If we move quickly to planning, you can see here the sorts of questions that we asked, talking about objectives, talking about are we addressing the threats to the values? Are we aware of the threats to the cultural and social economic values? How involved are the stakeholders? Do we have a comprehensive management system in place? And do we have a good compliance strategy? Again, not rocket science, pretty basic questions, but again, a series of checklists to help them understand where they perhaps are now and where they need to look at moving towards. That's planning. In some cases we recognised, and these questions are shown with this bright, bright pink colour, there was some uh, area, the concepts or, or uh, MPAs, as I said, like Sundarbans was an example, where they are doing a really good job and we could look at concepts that were more, more complex. So here was the concept of connectivity. We certainly don't expect every MPA in India to look at this, but we gave examples or, or um, some assessment criteria that were, as I said, at the, at the complex end of the MPA. I apologize for the dogs in the background, guys. That's, uh... okay, moving on to processes. Again, questions talking about, are we aware of the uh, relevant sectors and stakeholders? Are we aware of the level of training for staff, community engagement, level of compliance, level of monitoring and assessment, level of research. So again, basic questions with the checklist to help people understand and wherever possible, supporting documentation to understand it and fill it in. If we jump to outcomes, again, the same sort of questions. How many of the objectives have been achieved? Are the populations of your threatened species declining, stable or increasing? Are your values, and we stressed here the prioritised values, declining? Same with prioritised threats. Have the expe visitors' expectations been met? And how supportive are your local communities? Here's an example again of a question for, you know, only the top end MPAs. This was looking at how they adapted to climate change. And again, um, it's pretty subjective, but it did allow them to see where they needed to try and move towards looking at adaptation. So let's look at some of the conclusions from our experience in India. I think effectively having a systematic and well-recognized framework was useful. The approach we took was relatively simple, but it certainly covered all the elements of the, the six elements of management effectiveness. I stressed the need, as I said before, to have a really good understanding of context. That to me was critical. Unless they understood the context of their MPA, then they really didn't understand you know, how it impacted on the planning and their requirements for inputs and resources. I saw real value in managers being able to see, if they looked at it honestly, where they are now and where they should aim to be. I think that was useful in the Indian approach. But also, if they filled in the justification or the comments box properly, it was an important part of the assessment. So they could say why they felt that their score was as it was. And we pointed out the real benefits of this isn't just doing a one-off assessment. It's basically doing the same type of assessment using the same criteria over time to come up with those trends or as we saw in the Great Barrier, those sort of arrows. Where are we moving against our various assessments? I think this is the thing that we stressed with the Indians. Some other conclusions from India. There was some fudging of the scores. Uh, managers don't like to appear ineffective so basically we, we recognize there's a near, if possible, or a need for an independent audit or someone to moderate compared to other similar MPAs. But just before I leave that one, the, the reality though is even if there is a fudge score and not exactly as it should be, uh, it's still giving people an idea of where they are and where they need to be. There was an issue with some borderline assessments. If you go through a process Rating an activity as 49% on our scale gives a different answer to, to if it's 51%. So we have to sort of recognize that there is some um, issues there with, with borderline assessments or threshold calls. We also recognize that any of these processes, whether you're doing it in something like the Great Barrier or in some of the Indian, MBA, M, Indian MPAs, you do need some flexibility. 
and this iterative approach where the assessors make an assessment, whether it's a self-assessment or an independent assessment, and then cross-check, I think is really important. And the ability of the assessors to talk to other uh, assessors, whether they're looking at within the MPA or independent one, I think is useful. So let's look at some overall conclusions about management effectiveness. I think the IUCN framework is good, systematic, and it's certainly now globally recognized. I think there are real advantages in using a common format for all your management assessments. And I think the four point scale has, as I said, shown clearly you have to go one side or other of that middle ground. Um, I think there are other benefits. And as I said, if you take a systematic approach, the real benefit is over time, looking at the same type of assessment using the same criteria. The real indicator of success though is, is it bringing about changes in the way you do your management? Is it true adaptive management? And the other thing that's I think important, the reality is if you can bring in a, a outside perspective, community perspective, then your management assessment is even more realistic. I want to finish off with some conclusions from a handbook by, again, the sort of experts in this area, Sue Stolten and Nigel Dudley have a um, management effectiveness uh, tool handbook, and they talk about, you need to do this properly and answer all the questions. You can't just jump to the questions that you think are the ones that suit you. You need to plan your process. In other words, review the questions before even undertaking the assessment and really sort of collate the information you have before trying to make the assessment. Allow sufficient time. Um, we found in the Indian situation, you can't do it in less than one or two days. Many managers think they can just quickly knock this off and move on. We actually think to do it properly is a, a big job. Whilst repeat assessments may be a bit quicker, initially it certainly takes time. As I said before, wherever possible, use quantitative data, but we don't always have it, so use qualitative if you don't. But certainly for the outcome questions, quantitative is much more effective. And as I've said before, repeat the assessment periodically. This is really intended to track your progress, not just give you a one-off assessment of your management. So the real aim to repeat it at least every few years, but in a perfect world, make it part of your annual planning. A few more, uh, as I said before, consult and get consensus. Bring in those stakeholders from outside or the rights holders. Um, they will give you a much broader insight and perhaps tell you some things that either you weren't aware of or you didn't want to hear but are equally important. Verify your results. Use that independent expert um, approach but also look at other ways of getting it audited from externally. And again, the key point, implement the recommendations. The Doing the assessment is only the first step. You really need that adaptive management approach. So what's your action or plan of action to implement the results of your management effectiveness? And if possible, develop a communication plan to share those results. So if you want more information about the either of the approaches, the Great Barrier Reef Outlook Report on this website, the Gabrumpa website, there is both the Outlook Report, the little um, icon I've got, or the image I've got there is actually the Management Assessment Independent Report. All these are available on the Gabrumpa website. But I do stress that's the sort of the Rolls Royce end of the management effectiveness. And in many places around the world, we haven't got the luxury of doing it that way. We don't have the information and the experts. So the Indian approach, I think, is similar in many ways, but simpler. The two reports that I talked about there, they're both in press. Um, if people want to contact me, I'll give my um, email contacts in a minute, but I'm happy to provide the first one, which is finalized, just not printed. The second one, the evaluator's guide or the supporting documentation is still being finalized by my Italian, uh, sorry, Indian colleagues. Okay, so I'll leave it there. I'm happy to answer questions. And um, again, thanks to Lauren and Sarah for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, John. Uh, so you've actually anticipated one of the first questions, which was where can I get my hands on some of these tools? And uh, maybe you could just say a little bit more about uh, some of the templates and checklists that you provide. Are those in the second document that you mentioned that's not quite ready yet? 
the the checklist is in the framework. So the, the first document, I'll just go back to that. Um, the one called framework and criteria has the the checklists for each of the six elements. So that's but basically the sort of pro formas and and uh, lists or tables to help people think about the broad values or the threats. That's in the second what we're calling the evaluator's guide. So the first one, 48 pages is quite comprehensive, but it's really just the questions and the, and the self-assessment checklist. Okay, great. And I would like to encourage others uh, to please send in your questions if you have any or comments, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, so do have a couple of questions here. Uh, one from Bruce Jeffries, who, who comments, the open standards for conservation action and Marathi software can also be used, provide a useful storage and retrieval system for the suggested management effectiveness approach. So I don't know if that's something that you have had any experience with, John? Um, I'm certainly aware of the open standard stuff and yes, they've got some great information. So yes, I encourage people to look at that. I, I also want to stress the IECN approach is not the only one around. There are others, but I certainly have found this effective, as I said, in the two um, sort of case studies that I talked about today. So yes, I, I'm not suggesting these are the only approaches. There's many other checklists World Bank have done checklists. Um, some of the different NGOs around the place have done checklists. So yes, don't um, please don't ex uh, believe that I'm saying these are the only ones around and the only ones that should be looked at. So thanks, okay. Bruce, for that comment. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I think that's right. There are a lot of different tools, and I think one of the points that you've made in this talk today is, you know, the the scalability of this kind of approach, depending on how much information you have, and the sort of level of resources that the MPA has. So another question that came in is, what sort of tool do you use to analyze your data? Well, again, um, it depends on, on uh, what you've got accessible to you. Many of it's just literally an independent expert looking at the data and making his best judgment call. So the tool is between your ears. Um, the reality is you can use some pretty fancy tools but it's only as good as the information you use to put into it. So there are some, um, I'm sure I'm not aware of all of them, but there are some, you know, um, computerized decision support tools that could be considered. But I again stress you can spend an awful lot of time setting up a fancy tool and it really comes down to some pretty basic information. So I would be suggesting people don't look at fancy assessment tools, look at a simple approach but make sure they are looking across the all the six elements, not just one or two, like you know outcomes or outputs. And I would also stress, make sure you look at the broad range within the six elements of the sort of things I talked about in those questions, particularly raised in the uh, Indian approach. I think the Great Barrier Reef approach is, as I said, almost sort of the Rolls Royce end of the spectrum. And whilst it gave us an effective um, assessment of management effectiveness, it was really reliant on experts like Mark Hawkins was involved and he is now you know, regarded as a global expert in management effectiveness. So we were lucky. We had experts available to us who knew the process, could benchmark us against other places around the world and give an honest and, but independent assessment. Uh, many other MPAs won't have access to those experts. So I think even if it's a self-assessment approach as we did in India, um, Again, if you are honest in the way you do your assessment, then, and if you look broadly, you can get some good prioritized um, actions out of it. Great. So I have a question here from Julie Reamer who asks, given the recent demand for social science in MPA planning and management, where do you see qualitative data being most useful in this assessment framework? As I said earlier, I think um, wherever possible, we, we should be looking at all types of data and and Julie's absolutely right, we're, we're moving more towards the social and economic and cultural stuff, and some of that we don't have nice um, hard data. But yes, wherever possible, use the best available data would be my answer. Um, and in the uh, social and economic stuff, some of it is very qualitative, but it's just equally important. And again, if you look at it in a best possible way, using a sort of a, a, an assessment criteria that you can repeat down the track, then I think you've got something that is um, hopefully repeatable, to look at the trends. Um, some of these social and economic things are very difficult to look at trends, but use your best available you know, information. 
um, do it in a consistent way and I think it will give you an idea over time of where you're going and where you need to put your priority efforts. So we have a question here uh, asking if you have evaluated an ecologically connected network of MPAs. Well, I suppose the, the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, as I pointed out when I put up the map of the zoning, the green zones, if, we, if you remember back, make up one third of the entire Great Barrier Reef. And that area, as I said, is huge. It's the size of countries. So it is a, an ecological network in itself. In our case, we're just calling them zones but it's effectively an ecological network of, um, in this case, no-take zones. And yes, the, um, we, we now are recognising, the more we look, we recognise the importance of things like connectivity, um, the, the uh, flow-on from uh, you know, sink and source reefs and things like that. The, that's, this is probably way outside most of our management effectiveness assessments, but there are examples around the world where people are now looking at, at ways of things, how reserves are connected. And, uh, you know, often the, this issue of uh, integrity and, and connectivity, I think, are really important concepts. So another question from Bruce, who's asking, is the Outlook report you mentioned the same as the IUCN World Heritage Center Outlook report? No, it's quite different, Bruce. The um, IUCN Outlook report that I think some people are aware of is done by ICN for World Heritage. They used a lot of the concepts that we developed in the Great Barrier Reef. So theirs came after ours. So the Great Barrier Reef Outlook Report, and I have to admit that we pinched a lot of concepts from our NOAA colleagues. So these are all healthy plagiarism from around the world. But yes, the, the Great Barrier Reef Outlook is quite a separate report um, done, I think, uh, well, it's got a legal requirement for the eight different assessments. So under the law, there's a requirement to assess biodiversity. There's a requirement to assess um, use. There's a requirement to assess management effectiveness. So there's eight different assessments, which then uh, combine to produce the overall assessment of outlook. Whereas the IUCN World Heritage one, as I said, it builds on many of the same approaches, but it is quite different. And that's just focusing, focusing on world heritage areas around the world. All right, I'm going to invite our listeners to send in any other questions you have. And, and while you're doing that, I have one I wanted to ask. John, I think this is a, a great process that you've outlined, and I can see how it's really um, helpful in terms of identifying places for improvement and, uh, and perhaps, as you mentioned, also looking at trends. I think one of the challenges that MPA programs have these days is in demonstrating their value and the fact that they're working. And... I'm wondering how much you think this process can answer that question. Well, I think value is seen by different stakeholders and rights holders in different ways. And so I don't think there's, you know, it's, it's difficult to demonstrate one to, to one group uh, and then perhaps a different group is going to see it through a different lens. But the, the, the reality is I think this is something that is, if it's done involving those stakeholders, they can see, a, where you are in realistic terms, and B, where you might want to aim to be. And as I said, if it's done realistically and honestly over time, they can see how you are either improving your, um, the values in your MPA, are you achieving your goals and objectives? So I think it is a possible way of doing it in, in a more transparent way for stakeholders. Certainly, it's good for managers to recognise that perhaps they're not working in the areas of highest priority. Um, I want to stress that, you know, as managers, we can't do everything. We don't have enough resources to do everything, so we need to put our priorities or our efforts into the highest priorities. And I think this is useful for both managers and stakeholders to recognise that. So I think it is a useful tool. Um, it's only as useful as it, you know, how it's applied. And as I said, people can fudge the results or you know, try and put a gloss on it. Um, that's not going to help anyone. They're better off answering it honestly and looking at their MPA through a, a, you know, a broad lens of management effectiveness. And I'll come back. It's really important to look at all those six elements, not just home in on how are the, you know, what are the outcomes or what are the outputs.
So we do have another question who's asking, do you believe MPA should be larger scale like Great Barrier Reef or more small scale? And do you think these assessments of MPAs are more beneficial or easier with small versus large scale? I don't think there's a, a simple answer to the first part of the question, should they be large or small? I think it's horses for courses. So, you know, um, we see benefits of having large MPAs, but we also recognize that uh, politically and, and socially they mightn't be a, a, a relevant in some areas. So I think in general, um, if you look at a sort of an integrated broad area approach is the way to go. So my point is, there are many small MPAs around the world that probably aren't going to be viable in the long term because whilst they might, the small area might be very well managed, if in the marine environment all around is being overfished or polluted, then that small MPA is not going to be very viable in the long term. So my general uh, view is that larger is better, but as I said, politically and socially that mightn't happen. Larger brings other um, challenges, but I think in reality, I'd be stressing wherever it possible to go, not just large in terms of area, but large in terms of integrated management. In other words, not just a single sector type management or single, single agency. Very, very few places, even the Great Barrier Reef is managed by a single, uh, it's not managed by a single agency. The Great Barrier Reef has many, many agencies involved in management, whether we're talking shipping management agencies or the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority or Queensland Parks and Wildlife, or the border force. There are many, many agencies all work together in, in an integrated way to address that management. Uh, what was the second part of that question, Lauren? Sorry, I lost. Uh, no, I think you answered it, John. Okay, uh, right. The, the other kind of a related question to that, uh, I think has to do with um, more highly protected or no-take uh, prote protected areas versus multiple use. And you, you mentioned, you know, cumulative impacts being the 600 pound gorilla in the room and I'm wondering if you think it's more challenging to show uh, results from multiple use MPAs compared to uh, more highly restricted MPAs. I think it's challenging to show results across all MPAs irrespective of the type um, but I think this approach helps to, to demonstrate it. I think the cumulative impacts as I said earlier is one of, is the really big unknown. We, we talk about it an awful lot but it's really hard to assess um, I'm not aware of, and I'd love if anyone can um, shoot me an email with any good approaches to, to looking at cumulative impacts. Um, as I said, it's been talked about in the literature a huge amount, but it's really difficult to assess, and I don't think anyone's doing it particularly well around the world. So we have another question about the Great Barrier Reef asking, is, and this is from Maria Hatziolos, uh, is there a sense of frustration about the future of the Great Barrier Reef in light of the declining health of the reef from external drivers like climate change? Um, I know Maria, I mentioned World uh, Bank checklist. She was the one who got me involved in those. So back to the question, yes, there is a sense of frustration and, um, but we don't wanna give up. I mean, if, if we give up on the reef, then you know what hope, hope is there for many other MPAs? So yes, huge amount of frustration and, uh, you know, wish that we could do more, but you know, we are doing a fair bit. We're just not doing enough. The values are continuing to decline, which is sad. As a management agency, they're managing the decline of the overall values. But the, the question is, what would it be like if we weren't putting that effort in? And, and no one knows, and, and nor should we even try and guess that. But I would stress the, the reality is we are managing the decline of the Great Barrier Reef. It's, the bleaching is just one example of as I said, many cumulative impacts are impacting upon the reef. So another question from uh, Julie Reamer, if we're recommending independent auditing as a best practice in MPA assessment, is there concern that involving independent agencies might make this approach less acceptable? For example, in the same way that sustainability certification can be quite expensive. So wondering if this makes it more challenging or expensive to conduct this kind of work. Um, there's a potential for that, but I'm not uh, advocating we have to set up um, you know, huge certification agencies that do this. I'm just suggesting that you look outside your, if it's an MPA and you've got a self-assessment, self you might bring a series of managers together and benchmark your assessment against some of your colleagues. Um, or you bring in someone from the, uh, the agency who can do it but I, I'm certainly not advocating a, a whole new certification, independent approach that costs a lot of money. 
again, I think that can be a waste of uh, resources when we've got limited resources for MPA management. What I am advocating is don't just assume you know by answering it yourself that it's right. If you can get that independent verification, I think that would help. So you have a good day from Ian Baxter who asks, was there any thought given to assessing the different zones within the Great Barrier Reef as well as the overall assessment? Pressures vary enormously between zones given different levels of development, resource use, et cetera. Um, good question. The short answer is it, it wasn't done in the management effectiveness approach, but it has been looked at in, in other um, assessments. But can I give an example? The recent bleaching that happened in the far north of the Great Barrier Reef um, bleached corals totally independent of the underlying zoning. So even, uh, I'm not sure if I explained to people, we have that spectrum of zones. Uh, well, I explained that, but I didn't talk about the what we call our pink zones, which is called a preservation zone. It's effectively like a scientific baseline. It's a no-go zone. So uh, managers aren't even allowed in that zone unless they have uh, a research permit. And the only way that permit is issued is if that research cannot be done anywhere else. The bottom line is that the coral bleaching occurred in pink zones, green zones, blue zones, right across the, the spectrum of the zones. So that, that's an assessment of how zoning wasn't the answer to building resilience that we had hoped it would be. Um, in terms of how the other zones have, um, you know, um, operated in terms of management effectiveness, there's no, we didn't do a, a detailed assessment zone by zone, but we certainly looked at the broad, um, as I indicated, those 15 management activities or elements across the marine park. That was the way we did it. You could do it zone by zone, we just haven't done so up to now. Well, Ian's clarifying that he was actually asking about the geographic zones from far north to Capricorn Bunker. Uh, well, no, again, um, in the things like the um, management effectiveness, we didn't break it down that way. But there have been other assessments that have looked at that. And if I can give an example, there was a document called the Strategic Assessment for the Great Barrier Reef. And that did clearly indicate that what happens in the far north is clearly, you know, because I was at I said earlier, 14 degrees of latitude, quite different to what's happening in the south. So that did break the reef into four broad geographical areas, inshore, offshore, north and south. And that assessment, um, again, if people are interested, um, send me an email and I'll flick them the, the link to the strategic assessment, which did look at um, a whole series of the values across those four broad areas. And if we look at something like corals, it's quite clear today, the coral, the value of the corals in the north where we've had the, the huge bleaching, back-to-back -back bleaching, compared to, say, the central and the southern is quite different. So, yes, it is important to look geographically, as Ian indicated. Uh, the management effectiveness approach didn't do that, but we've done it in other approaches in the Great Barrier Reef. So, John, you mentioned that zoning wasn't, didn't turn out to be the answer that some of you had hoped for an impact like coral bleaching. And Gonzalo Cid is asking kind of a related question. Have you had the experience through this, these assessments of helping or recommending MPAs to reevaluate some of their goals and objectives? Um, I haven't had that experience, but I, I think it's an important one. Just while we're talking goals and objectives, and thanks for the question, Gonzalo, I think it's important that people recognize that you should have a prioritized list of objectives. Many of our MPAs have a list of objectives, which is great, but unless you put a priority on those, then either managers or decision makers can cherry pick and choose the objective that suits their particular um, you know, desire at the time. So the example I'll give is the Great Barrier Reef has a very clear hierarchy of objectives. We have in the act, a very clear primary objective, which is the protection of the values, the biodiversity, environment, and heritage values of the Great Barrier Reef. So that's the primary objective. And then the wording in the Act says, subject to that primary objective, allow other objectives. And so it goes on to talk about sustainable use. But it's a very clear hierarchy, and I'd again stress this to managers. If they haven't got a hierarchy in their objectives, they may want to consider looking towards that. The hierarchy of objectives is also brought about by the different zones. And within each zone, we have a hierarchy of objectives. So if you look at, for example, the green zone, the no-take zone in the Great Barrier Reef, the actual legal wording, the objective for that zone, 
talks about the high priority being the protection of the values. And then it says, subject to that primary objective, allow for um, effectively or tourism. So the, the green zone encourages tourism, but it has to be done subject to pr protecting the uh, biodiversity values. So this idea of prioritizing objectives and goals, I think is important. I haven't had the opportunity to do this a lot with um, many countries that have existing areas, but I certainly advocate it when I talk to people about the need for setting up goals and objectives. In other words, don't have just a flat series of objectives. Think about what's the priority and make it very clear. And if, if it differs across the MPA, then perhaps you're leading towards a zoning approach. Hopefully that answers your question, Gonzalo. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I think, uh, Kevin Passfield is circling back to the question that was earlier about um, small MPAs versus large, uh, and also the, the question about MPA networks. And he, he comments that his question was not so much about single small MPAs, but about uh, where you have a network of small MPAs that operate as a network, and how one would go about evaluating uh, an entire network. Well, I think the point I, or the example again I'd give was, you know, if, if you can uh, do it in a consistent way, then you are able to compare across a network. Um, so again, if each of the MPA managers in this network is using the same approach, then it gives you a basis for doing some comparative. However, if they each do their own separate thing, uh, totally you know, using a different technique or a different approach, then I think it'd be very hard to, to uh, assess that network. But I would say using a common approach, the sort of thing I've outlined, would allow you towards assessing that network in a consistent and hopefully effective way. All right, and Robin Adams asks a question, I think it's similar to the question about values that I had asked earlier, um, saying you measure MPA management effectiveness, but what about measuring MPA's effectiveness against its objectives that can determine its governance, ecological and socioeconomic contribution and the ways in which this can justify an MPA's existence? Uh, Robin, I think you'd find if you look closely at each of the questions across the six elements, we are looking more than just assessing values. We are looking at all the things you talked about. So I think if you look at those, uh, those questions, you'll find that it does look broader. And Bruce Jeffries has another comment. Um, it says, it was great and useful presentation. My only problem is the way we divide the terrestrial and marine environments and ecosystems. Most of these principles apply to both, don't they? Absolutely. And so, Bruce, that's why you'll find that the IUCN, for example, in their categories, don't differentiate. They have one definition of a protected area. They don't talk about a definition for terrestrial protected areas or in a different definition for marine. There's one definition under IUCN for a protected area. There is one set of categories that apply across both. So you're absolutely right. And I made the comment earlier in the Great Barrier Reef presentation where I talked about the adjacent catchment being such a huge um, you know, influence on the downstream marine park. So whilst, and this is, a, I think, a real um, challenge for many MPA managers, your jurisdiction and your area of responsibility may only re, uh, rest in the marine area, but those coastal and adjacent catchments have so such a big influence on your MPA. So you mightn't have management influence over them, but if you can demonstrate the the, the impacts and the importance of those areas, through an approach like this, then I think you can work with some of those adjacent managers and adjacent um, jurisdictions, local authorities, et cetera, to recognize that they are having an impact on your downstream MPA. So absolutely agree, terrestrial marine, it's a very artificial line. We, ne we need to think uh, much broader using a true ecosystem-based approach to our management. Well, John, we're just about out of time. So I just wanted to uh, thank you and also invite you to say any closing words. I think sometimes MPA managers are not doing enough of this assessment work. Uh, they may feel overwhelmed, like they've got other things that are more immediate. And I guess I would just invite you to give any closing advice for managers who know that they should be doing this, but maybe are not doing it as much as they ought. Well, I, I think you've summarized it up, Lauren. I totally agree. Um, most of us aren't doing enough of this to sort of self-reflect how we're we going. As I said earlier, we, we can't do everything. Um, there are many, many competing priorities. So this sort of approach helps us to prioritize what are the important issues. If you think back to the way I was talking about prioritizing your threats, 
looking at it from a spatial and a temporal and a um, management response approach, those sort of things do help managers focus in on where they should be putting their efforts. It also, as I said, if you think back to that checklist of the benefits, this can be used to, the, to your advantage to, to demonstrate to your decision makers where you need more resources. So it's not just that something that's something you need to do, tick and flick and get rid of it and get on with management. It actually should be seen as something to help your management. So yes, Lauren's right, it does take time. As I said earlier, this is not something you can do quickly and dirty and get it out of the way. Well, you can, but I think it's worth doing well because it can have benefits way beyond just um, you know today's actions. It can look at setting priorities for your future and should be the basis for your annual planning. So thanks again for the opportunity. Again, if people want to follow up, I've given my uh, email at the end of the uh, presentation. Happy to follow up with any email questions. And thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much, John. And to anyone who would like to see the recording or share it with others, it will be posted on the Open Channels website. So thanks to you all.